Yeah, I'm, I'm Travis Ferriden, and um, I've got a um, runner, as it happens, down in, uh, on the Bellarine Peninsula, and Mike is my uh, very good friend and right-hand man in that. And, um, yeah, so uh, I won't tell you much about Mike. He'll, he'll tell you all about himself, which is, uh, which is a great story. So um, put the seatbelts on, because this is going to be a rough ride. <laughs> okay, Mike. What do you what do you remember about your childhood? Uh, not a lot. Um, I uh, I have a mental illness which is uh, classified uh, as um, a dissociative. Or well, it's um, schizoaffective disorder, which means I don't remember a lot of my childhood because it was very traumatic. Okay, well, we, yeah. we won't <laughs> we won't we won't dwell there then. Uh, how, what was your relationship with your parents like? Ah, oh, I grew up in a really harsh family. Um, I know my dad did the best he possibly could, and um, but still, it it was uh, we didn't have a lot of money. Dad was working three jobs. Um, mum was a stay-at-home mum until we were uh, old enough to go to primary school, and then she went and got a job. So um, that's key kids, I guess. Um, and I, yeah, uh, just I, I remember the, the bad bits, unfortunately. Yeah. They're not really good bits. Yeah, okay. Um, did you go to church as a child? Yes. Um, we were brought up in a, a, a Christian cult. Um, and, um, yeah, it's uh, basically focusing on works and works through salvation and um, law and not a lot of grace um, that was that was my take of it and um, that's kind of what I remember um, and a few other people remember so um, yeah I didn't there, there wasn't a lot of Jesus in that church in fact they said that Jesus is not God he's the son of God so that's yeah Okay, so um, you had a few concerns, like um, you know, concerns of being excommunicated because of um, you know sinning. You were always told you know you're not allowed to sin, that sort of stuff. So can you tell us a bit about that? True. Um, I I believed that that was the only church that that could you could be in at the time. So if you sin, you'll be kicked out of the church and excommunicated. So there's this whole fear, um, especially in your childhood, um, of doing the wrong thing. And if you did, you didn't tell anybody. So it's, um, I, I, um, I had a really hard time trying to grapple, grapple with that as a kid. Okay. Um, yeah, what were your teenage, teenage years like, Mike? Um, I don't remember a lot. Oh, well, um, <laughs> at the age of 14, um, I discovered I liked having sex with men um, in public parks, and that happened probably three times a day. Um, so, yeah. Um, not very good. Um, yeah, okay. I, I felt trapped because I couldn't tell my parents about it because that was sinning. So I was, I was basically a sex addict at, at, at uh, 14. Yeah. Yeah. So your, your mum, mum and dad be, uh, were friends with this guy that um, a lot older than you that moved in as a boarder. Yeah. There's a story with that, Mike. Um, one day oh, I got to know a guy who was 35 and I was 17. Um, and then he found out where I lived. And then somehow, I don't know, don't even know how, he got talking to mum and dad out the front um, and then started coming to church with us. And I was trapped. I couldn't tell anyone about what we'd done. And then he was saying that he had tr struggled with his parents. So um, he came to live with us. Um, so 
I was sleeping in the same room and that happened for about 18 months until um, my parents found out and then I was I was in a, on, in a camp in New South Wales and I told one of my friends and the culture in a cult is you have to tell the leaders everything. So I just came, disclosed it to one of my friends who went all the way up to um, the so Chinese whispers, all the way up to the leader of the cult who sent me back, back to Melbourne um, and I had a meeting with him and then got home. And this, this guy, this 35 year old was still living in my house. And I said, get out. Um, so, and I was punished for having that relationship and lying and excommunicated. Um, and there was no grace in that at all. Mm. So um, you left home then? Yeah. So where did, where did you go? Well, I, I thought I was in love with a girl over that period because I thought I was healing, you know, denial, that kind of stuff. Um, and then I, I was excommunicated for six months and I came back and then... And then um got to get got to know this girl who was living in stall who was then then moved to melbourne then found out she was interested in my brother um and then uh i said oh that's okay as long as you're okay so i ended up um yeah living with then she dumped my brother for my housemate which was a little bit weird um, and then I ended up going out with her best friend in stall as a first girlfriend. Uh, and then she dumped me for my dad's best friend's son. So that's the kind of relationships you you get in a cult. Sorry, I'm digressing. No, that's all right. Um, so and you sorry, moved to Melbourne. Yeah, you moved uh, to Melbourne. What, and, what, was, what was things like in Melbourne? Um, I... I moved in with someone in the church um, and then um, a few months after that, I started, I really, I was still going and having sex with men, you know, the age of 19. Um, and I didn't need an excuse to, to leave the church. So I started smoking and then they kicked me out of church for smoking. I thought, oh, perfect. Um, so I moved, moved to St Kilda um, and discovered alcohol. I was living in a rooming house at 19 with um, a broken window and um, a just horribly horrible rooming house with old people and stuff. Um, but I didn't know any different. So I, I ended up drinking a lot, becoming an alcoholic. Um, we'll, we'll cover the suicide attempts later on yep. when we get, when you, when you, um, yeah. So, um, so you used to, you were on medication, you used to self-medicate. Yeah. Tell us a little um, bit about that. I was self-medicating. I went from to ha having, because I was mentally ill and undiagnosed, I, um, I, I had a lot of, I went through a lot of jobs and I went through a lot of houses. Um, and that, that period of my life, the next three years was basically homelessness going from couch to couch or whoever would have me or relationship to relationship because that's how you got a roof over your head um yeah and then i um that was until i was about 23 um and then i thought i'll i'm sick of this i'll go to queensland that's going to fix everything by moving to the gold coast yeah. So you had um, friends suggested that you um, you may have had multiple personalities. Can you yeah. tell us about that? Oh, well, I as I was leaving for Queensland, the um, the guy who uh, ex boyfriend slash housemate slash whatever uh, told me that I was crazy and that I had more than one personality and I should look into that. And I thought I was I was offended. Uh, but he, he was absolutely correct. Um, but I, I got to Queensland. Do I tell the Queensland story now? 
Yeah, well, yeah, we're going to Queensland. Yeah, so you went to Queensland. Um, what was life, life like up there? Well, uh, I found a guy, uh, slept on a couch, and then, um, yeah, uh, stayed with him for a while and then decided I didn't like him anymore. So I moved to Southport um, and then moved to Broadbeach, I think. Um, I, I got a job at Roger David um, in one of the things, the uh, shopping centres up there. And things were looking good. Um, and then I met this guy who was who decided he liked me, but he was he was married um, and he was an ecstasy dealer. So he introduced me to hard drugs. Um, I was already smoking um, soft drugs. Um, so everything was really off off the chart. And then um, one day, he he came to see me and I I was living in a um, backpackers uh, in a room. My my room literally looked like a bomb hit it. Uh, looked like it looked like a teenager's bedroom for the dads out there and granddads. So um, I I had no and at this point I was completely psychotic um, and really really horribly bad situation um so i um i uh, i went to see my i was i had some a fight with some of the guys at the no, an argument with some of the guys at the um at the um hostel and uh the, my friend came to see me he said do you want to go out i said no i've got to stay here um and share some drugs with some people to search for that I'm nice. So he, he left. Um, and I was in fear of my life at that point because paranoia is like up here. Um, and as well as just goes hand in hand with psychosis. Um, so I slept the night in some sort of cave near the beach. And um, the next morning I woke up and I knew something was wrong. Something was definitely wrong. So I tried, I called his wife and he hadn't come home and I tried calling him and didn't answer the phone. So I called the police and said, has anyone been murdered lately? And they said, yes, they have actually, uh, stay there. We're coming to get you. So, um, they interviewed me over the course of the next few hours. Uh, and then, uh, uh i had i had a minuscule amount of marijuana in my in my um bag which they found they said why would you take marijuana to a police station I said okay right and so they locked me up for the weekend um and then the next that on the monday they let me go and um uh i then went to my friend's house and he my friend said look you need a lawyer because you're the number one suspect for murder. And I'm like, oh, okay. Um, so he arranged a lawyer, we went to a lawyer, lawyer and he said, I said, look, I don't have any money. I'm basically homeless. And he said, that's okay. For murder one, we don't even start the meter. So that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, so I did that um, and they let me go um, after a while. And then um, I was really, really upset. So I decided that's it. I'm going to end it all. Um, so I went out to the spot where we was found uh, on the spit in um, Gold Coast, if anyone knows it. And um, I took lots of pills and lots of alcohol. And I, that was it. I, I was, uh, and I cut my wrists a lot very a, a lot and um, I just went to sleep and then the next thing I knew someone was carrying me through bush and then the next thing I knew I was in a car 
and then the next thing I knew, I was at a clinic and a nurse was saying, don't move, I've called an ambulance. And then the next thing I knew, I was waking up in Gold Coast Hospital. So, um, yeah, I, this, I, I don't know who could have found me or it just, just was, I'm pretty sure it was Jesus actually, or an angel, um, one of those Old Testament big angel type dudes. Um, so two weeks later, I was on my way back to Melbourne. Yeah, okay. Um, so what, what did you do at, um, in, when you got back to Melbourne? Um, the first thing I did was, oh, I was so insane. Um, I, <laughs> I, I, I tried to find somewhere to live and it was, I, my whole twenties is, is basically a blur. Um, so I just, I just remember the highlight, this is part of the highlight reel. Um, but I, um, I don't even know where I was living. I just, I have no idea. Uh, but eventually I found a place, um, and I found a job and I found a psychiatrist who, um, yeah, basically, uh, right. I eventually ended up in the Heatherton, which is a psych unit. Um, and then back to Melbourne. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you, you, you had a dream. Yeah. yeah um, about a year later. Oh, I don't even know. Um, I was about 24. So how, whatever that was. Um, and I had a dream that I was at church. Um, uh, one of those gospel type church churches that you see in the US black churches. Um, and I really liked it. So I thought, Hmm, I should, I should go to church. And the next day someone came up to me in the street, in the, in the Merck street, Burke street mall and asked me to go to church. And I said, yes, immediately. I, <laughs> uh, yeah. So the church that I went to was also a cult. They said, but baptism is by salvation. And we all know it's not. Um, so that I was there for six months. Um, and they basically tell you where to live and, and all that sort of stuff. So that they monitor every facet of your life. Um, and then I came out of that through um, some cult busting and then decided to go to uh, Swanson Street Church of Christ. Um, and then they, that was a few years later that I eventually got to Swanson Street Church of, Church of Christ um, in the year 98. No, right. No, 97 um, is when I was still gay. I was working at Crown Casino Hotel. I was working full time. I was doing really, really, really well. Um, I was a supervisor um, in one of the departments and I met a guy um, and his name is Gary and uh, I fell in love that that night um, and we kind of shacked up and then we got married in 1998 on stage as a musical um, at a gay festival um, and we, yeah. Um, we ended up living together. Um, but in the year, then I went to Swanson Street Church of Christ. I'm trying to hurry. <laughs> um, yeah. And then uh, started working in a Christian bookshop um, that was attached to Swanson Street Church of Christ. And um, I was very sick at the time because I needed, I had to leave work because I wanted to blow it up. Um, and I was very, very sick at the time. Um, and tried to commit suicide on my birthday and that brought my husband and my family together um, and they liked each other after that, which is kind of nice. Um, but then at Swanson Street Church of Christ, they accepted us as a couple, um, but 
over the period of time of working in a Christian bookshop, you learn stuff, you absorb stuff. You, I went from sitting on a couch for three hours to becoming assistant manager in 18 months. And um, then I had a crisis of faith. Um, and I knew God wanted more from me. Um, God wanted more from my life. Um, during that process, I had to say, look, I need to sleep in the spare room because we can't do this anymore. And he said, fine. Um, and then I had a breakdown again and I decided to go the other way to Adelaide this time. I actually hitchhiked um, from Melbourne to Adelaide. Mm. Uh, and stayed with a friend in Adelaide and then kept going to Port Pirie. Um, and I was completely insane by then. And I, I'd i stopped sleeping. And I, I couldn't take medication because the voices inside my head were telling me not to take medication. So that stage, Mark? I had four. four. Um, so the, I, there was an internal... <laughs> There was an internal war actually inside my head that I was battling with. Um, and then um, I got to Port Pirie and thought I was normal and then got a, a flat within a couple of weeks and found a woman and um, she got engaged within a month. Um, and then I was, I was normal according to me. So I, I kept on applying to these jobs around Port Pirie and not, not getting any, wondering why I, I, I didn't, couldn't get a job. Um, so I was rejected by a lot of people in Port Pirie and then eventually ended up in a psych ward in Adelaide. Um, and then they told me that I wasn't, um, I, could, I could leave whenever, whenever I wanted. So I, I literally ran as soon as I possibly could, thinking the police were chasing me and there's that paranoia again. Um, and then uh, got back home and no one was after me. In fact, um, yeah, my fiance had um, locked herself out of the house, so I had to break windows to get in, but that, that was, anyway. Um, I knew that I was heading for prison and I didn't know what for, um, I just thought, I, I can't sustain living on without any direction at all. So I tried to get as much help as possible. And I thought, I don't want to end up in prison in, in South Australia. I want to be in prison in Melbourne where I knew start, new people. Were so you, I went back to, okay. were, were, you getting, were you getting much help with uh, your medication or was it frustrating you? Uh, Port Pirie is a very frustrating place if you're insane. Um, I tried to get help with, with a psychologist, um, but I told the nursing staff that I was carrying a knife and that they took that as a threat. So I was, wasn't allowed to go to the hospital anymore. I was banned. So I thought this is stupid. So um, I went back to Melbourne um, and basically homeless yep. um, and my ex was preparing to go back to Sydney where he was based, he, he was from and then um, uh, I tried to get some help because I knew it was coming um, and no one would help me. Um, I went to the Salvation Army, um, the crisis centre in, in St Kilda and they just said look nothing we can do um, she, the, the woman at Salvation Army rang the, the psych people and said, look, he needs help now. Um, and they said, no, nah, I can wait till the morning. And it turns out it couldn't because I went and burnt down uh, a shop at the end of a pier. Uh, the shop was 99 years old. So, um, yeah, it, I, people were outraged, outraged. So, so you, yeah. you did that out of frustration because you weren't getting any help. Yeah. Uh, the, what it is? The, the, 
the internal struggle with my head was was the only thing that mattered like i was so sick of it that I, I didn't care what i did i didn't care if anyone died at the time you know i just needed to a relief so i um he he was telling me this other voice was telling me to burn down the building and i just said okay fine i don't care anymore um and and at that point i was really dangerous because um i'd given up yeah. so the next day i had a interview with the police and they didn't i had to convince them that i'd actually done it um because i was pretty crazy at the time um and then it got all over the news and everything was fine after that yep so um yeah how many characters do you have in your head that, at that stage as far as i know still four yep yep but it gets you it increases later okay um you you were um held on remand for the yep. uh for the arson yeah um you got a psychologist report what did what did that uh, what was that re recommendation? Well, the recommendation from the psych from the first psychiatrist report was never to let me out. And my lawyer came back to me and said, "What did you say? What? What?" I said, "I just told them the truth." Yeah. Um, so he had to get a second psychiatrist report. So things were going pretty bad yeah. in your head then. Yeah. All right. So. You're you're on remand. Um, yep. What was your what was your experience like in jail? Uh, I my experience in jail was blessed. I was I, I I was protected in every way, shape, and form the whole time I was in prison. Eighteen months. Um, I was on remand for fifteen months, um, and then uh, I got my day in court. And I, what I did was I wrote to the judge and said exactly what happened and, and my history and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then when I actually got to court, the prosecutor uh, didn't actually turn up. No, sorry, sorry. The, yeah, yeah, the, the police prosecutor didn't even turn up. So um, that left uh the defense counsel to ask all the questions so at every point that the de defense counsel um tried to make against me the judge actually refuted every single claim that said you know if you were if he's so dangerous um why didn't he get help and it was just amazing um so uh in prison i um learned to socialize i learned to eat healthy um i learned to uh i stopped smoking um i joined i had a personal trainer uh, as one of the prison mates i was in the best unit of um the man jail that you could possibly get i was in a very very privileged position Okay, so you um you were sentenced after you know you're on remand for what, fifteen months. You were sentenced, yeah. and um, what was your sentence? Uh, the judge gave me uh, sixteen months yeah. and uh, twenty months parole, but that yeah. down, turned out to be eighteen in, eighteen out, and I got out at Easter two thousand five. So you went, you were released into your father's custody. Yeah. What happened there? Um, on that, um, that prison is where I began my relationship with my father. Um, he came to see me with my ex every single week um, without fail yep. for 18 months. And he had to, uh it's uh probably a two hour trip and it takes an hour to get in there um and then a two hours back so um that was 
amazing. And one one day he said to me, what did I do wrong? And I, I'd already forgiven him for everything else. And I said, look, you did the best you possibly could. Um, yeah, and my ex postponed his uh, moving to Sydney until I got out. Yep. So. Okay, so... Um... <clears throat> So you're out now, and uh, yep. you moved to moved to Ocean Grove. Yeah. Um, you were you were because you're in your father's custody. You were back in the cult, but that didn't yep. work out. Uh, well, no, I didn't go back into the cult. I oh. went to um, the church I'm at now, which is uh, Ocean Grove Baptist. Mm -hmm. um, and the way. I, I I I had a look I talked to. I had an interview with a senior pastor and I said, oh, um, I have, I've just come out of prison um, and I have, uh, I'm on parole and I have massive mental health issues um, and uh, I have got this problem and this problem and this problem um, and can I go to your church? Um, and he said, look, can I talk to our eldership about it? And I said, sure. And he came back to me and he said, look, we'd, we'd like you to come to our church and we'd like you to offer you a mentor and we'd like to find you a psychologist. Um, and that, that was just the best gift that I could possibly find. And my, the, the 18 months was horrible living with my parents. I actually, at one point I, I, I spoke to my parole officer and I said, can I go back into prison? And she said, no, that wasn't an option. So I, I just, we just had to, as soon as the 18 months was up, I moved out um, and they said, sure, go. <laughs> and today um, I have a really good relationship with my parents. Yeah, that's good. Um, okay, so you were... Um your experience in, in prison, um, you know, that was very, very good. You were back on track. You were, you were medicating properly. You were eating properly. You were socialising, yep. all those things you just said. And then you uh, you move into a church and they're jumping over backwards to help you out. Yep. Um, so that led to, uh, you went back, went to the Gordon to do some study. Yep. yep. And just very briefly cover that. Okay. Briefly, I um, was at the Gordon for about four years, um, part-time. I did a Cert 3 in community computers. I did a diploma of computer hardware and a, uh, I think a diploma of um, multimedia. Mm. Um, and then I started my own business in 2009. Um, yeah yeah so the other the other thing was uh you did a diploma of mental health which is um would have been a big advantage in what you're doing now which we'll cover shortly yeah okay so um you set up your business and then, then you met jade yeah she's <laughs> awesome yeah, she um, two weeks before we 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 met at um carols by candlelight and she well, that's that's my rendition. Um, and she saw me standing on sitting on my own, and she said, "Come and share me bl share our blanket." She was with her family, and I thought that was really nice. Um, and then a year or so after that, I said, "Look, I'm about to start my computer fixing." She she said, "Look, I need you to get you around and fix my computer." I said, "Look, I'll start charging in two weeks." So. You better get in soon. So the, ne the next week I went around to her house and then she said, I, I don't have a lot of money, I can't. And then I said, sure. So we went out on a first date and it was amazing. Um, and we were, I said, um, uh, about a week later, you know, we were hanging out and she said, are you interested? I said, look, I'm gay. And she said, no, you're not. And I'm like, okay. Um, and then um, I, uh, 
yeah, I, we, we hung out a lot and we took, I then started seeing a counsellor um, because dating women was basically foreign to me and I didn't, didn't know how it was going to work or any, anything like that. Um, and then I found out that I had eight characters, personalities, um, and how did, you get, how did you get how did you get rid of those? Like you were you were gay, now you're married yeah. to a beautiful woman, yeah, um, and you had eight characters in your head. How did how yeah. did you how did you turn your life around, right? Um, it's it's God. It's going through going having meaningful activity. It's 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 finding out um, basically. Two of the two of the two of my characters were under under thirteen, and that didn't matter until she she had kids as well. So a thirteen year old can't exactly, you know, look after a twelve year old. But Jade had kids. Yeah. yeah. So um, I I needed it. It just wasn't working anymore. So I needed to take back authority in my own life in my own life um and have courage to do that yep. so yeah so um yeah one of the one of the um phrases that this establishment um was was built on was you gotta wanna yeah right so, exactly so you 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 Wanted to get rid. Of, you wanted to straighten out. You wanted to get rid of all these characters, and then. Uh, well, so... I didn't want to get rid of them. Yeah. I, I I needed to step up and take control. Yep. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't mind them being there. Um. But the re the reason why they're there is similar to PTSD. It's one step away from that. So PTSD, um, put you back there, um, and then. One step away from that is you've got a mode that takes over and and wants to 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 help run those things so you don't have to so you step back it's yeah. it's dissociative identity disorder so um that that because you can't cope that gives them um what we call legal rights to be there um so fast forward twenty years. Um, I'm interested, I'm taking back control of my life. Um, so they no longer have legal rights to be there mm. um, because I want to do the stuff that they were doing. Yeah. Okay. Then. Um, so um, now you're married. Um, yeah. What are the things, um, what do you the things you're getting into now what what's your life like now well um i just go spent, from say uh three three four week, four years ago yeah i i spent about six years in prison ministry um yeah. with a church called friends of dismas who's a post-prison ministry so they um help people coming who have come out of prison uh, with families and and loved ones um our son uh who the 13 year old um had a really hard time dealing with our relationship um so he turned to drugs at the age of 13 so he was an ice addict um and then um kept on drugs and then uh, when he was 19 he went into prison um for um fatally killing someone when he was driving he got sentenced to eight years with five minimum so part of that process of me being in prison ministry meant that the day he went into prison um we had someone from prison fellowship talking to him face to face um and that is god that that is that is that is provision right there. Um, so I, we, we were able, with Trevor, we are able to start a Friends of Dismas in Geelong about three years ago. Um, and then 
there was a moment um, I tried to do more in pri with prison ministry and doors were slamming in, in my face, basically, um, all the stuff that I tried. And then there was one time where I had to travel three hours on a train to get to an interview with um, an ex a, someone who's coming out of prison and he didn't turn up. And I said to God, this isn't fair. This is not fair. And he said, you don't have to do this. What about mental health? You, you should just do this. So that was my, um, that was, that was my alter moment that, that I spoke to God and, and just reaffirmed that I wanted to follow God whichever way he had for me, not whatever way I, I thought it would look like. Um, so I ended up stepping down from prison ministry and got, and, but part of that process of prison ministry was doing a diploma of ministry just, um, through uh, Eastern College, which was the old table. Um, and the day I left, the day I finished that, the next day there was a job offer um, at our op shop that runs through our church. So I'm now working part-time there and I'm looking at, um, I do a lot of work in mental health about three days, three days a week. And I'm hoping that leads to um, a volunteer chaplaincy position in Geelong mental health. Yeah, so you're you're doing doing stuff with um, organisations like Hive and yep. Simmer. Yep. Um, yeah, you also um, do the sound desk. You're you've trained people for the sound desk at the church. Right? Yep. Um, you do shed happens. Um, yep. And you're manager of the op shop. Yep. So, um, yeah, so life's life's pretty good now, and. You've you've gotten rid of all all the characters in your head. Yeah. Yep. So. Do you want to know how? Yeah, I, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought I asked that before, and yeah. Yeah. yeah um, I don't know how. So I I was I, I got a bit distracted. Um, yeah. After about a year of marriage, um, God's prompted me to go back into counselling, um, spiritual direction, and counselling. And I got to the counsellor and I said, look, I'm not interested in getting rid of my personalities. And she said, fine. But we, um, with spiritual um, prayer counselling, uh, there's not a lot of um, brain stuff that goes, it's all heart stuff. Um, so after working with some of the heart stuff, um, those other personalities um, or modes, as sometimes called, um, were seen as as redundant. So they were taken to the cross, and they were left there basically. Um, so I now only have one personality and have had only one personality for a very long time. Oh well, four years, whatever it is. Yeah. Um yeah, Mike. Some this this is going onto YouTube, so it'll be out there. Um, so, can you explain what going to the cross means? Okay. Um, so people I, people that don't believe wouldn't understand what taking things no, to the cross means. Yes. Okay. Um, that's why I was trying to keep it a bit um, general. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, spiritual 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 counselling um, is uh, when you find someone to, who's ex, an experienced Christian counsellor who can pray through the issues, um, you seek God and then you start talking about what, what's being revealed to you. Um, and then um, as God works through the person and yourself, you give permission um, and you repent of whatever that you've done and, and, and by not as she 
in Jesus name, she spoke over these, the entities, if you want, um, and then bound them uh, in Jesus' blood and nailed it to the cross spiritually. So each one, one at a time. And um, unfortunately, well, fortunately for me, it really went really well, but it has to be done with a lot of supervisation, supervision. Um, and, you know, it got to the point where you know, we had to mourn the loss of the characters in my life. Um, but, yeah, that was in 2000. We got married in 2012 and it happened in 2013. So um, the, I... That is the only reason why I, I, I'm a dad now, is a successful dad. I have got two wonderful kids. Um, Alex is drug free. Um, he's doing really well. He's been looked after, just like I was looked after um, in prison. Um, Zoe's just the most amazing woman. She's now 20. Um, and she's respectful and she's... Um, she cares about people and she's a nurturer and she's just an amazing person. So it's good. Yeah. All right. Um, well, I think that's about it, Mike. And uh, yeah, thanks very much for, uh, for all that. And thanks for being so on honest and open and, and it's been, uh, been really good. And I, uh, yeah. So uh, thank you very much. It's all right. Yeah. We went Thanks, a bit man. over time. Sorry, fellas. Oh well, I think um, I think the powers that be were sort of expecting that, eh, Simon? <laughs>